It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor George Smoot, uh, today's speaker. Uh, he just became uh, IAS professor last year at HKUST. So uh, let's welcome him to HKUST. Okay, George uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006, uh, jointly with Professor Mayer uh, for their work on the uh, black body uh, uh, radiation universe and the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, with its anisotropy properties. Uh, I'm not going to go any further of this work because that uh, will be uh, the content of his talk. Uh, at least part of it. Uh, this work helped to further the Big Bang Theory and the inflationary universe scenario uh, that uh, many cosmologists uh, love today. According to the Nobel Committee, uh, their work, or so-called the COBE uh, satellite, uh, can be regarded as the starting point for cosmology as a precision science. Before we talk about things which are order magnitude, uh, now it's really to very precision uh, measurements, uh, which is uh, spectacular, uh, as you hear. George donated his share of the Nobel Prize money to a chari charitable foundation, uh, which is uh, very uh, I mean, impressive to many of us. Uh, he also is well known for uh, one of the two contestants to win uh, a million dollar prize on a US game show, which is called, uh, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Fifth grader is primary five. Okay. So uh, apparently that's also a major achievement because there are more Nobel laureates than the winner of this contest because there's only two so far. Uh, George uh, received his uh, degrees, bachelor and PhD from MIT uh, in 1970, and then he moved on to Berkeley, and he's been there for uh, more or less ever since. Uh, he's also have appointment in Paris Center of Cosmological Physics right now, and so uh, we are very happy to have him uh, spend uh, part of his time every year uh, to interact with us. And I think that uh, uh, George would be happy to talk to students uh, 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 as interest. Uh, George was, uh, I don't want to go over because he has won so many prizes, you know. Uh, and he's also uh, known to be a great teacher and a keen advocate of popular science. He also wrote a popular science book called Wrinkles in Time. Uh, but uh, without going the long list of his uh, prizes and awards, uh, let me just let George uh, to, uh, explain uh, uh, today's work on mapping universe. So let's thank George. Welcome. Him. So thank you. I think I'm live now, and uh, I uh, you can actually sort of read the uh, thing. There is an attempt. I have to thank Zhao for. Helping me get the character, get the words and the characters and traditional Chinese correctly, I hope. And so that's supposed to say modern cosmology, you know, mapping the universe. <laughs> but we'll see. So originally I planned the technical talk for IAS, but uh, Henry and colleagues asked for me to give a popular talk for my first lecture here. And so we're giving a popular talk. So first I'm going to show you a short section of a movie. So this this one the room has to be dark, but unfortunately the, my computer runs slow here. But this is a movie, which was uh, from a time period. So you can see how dark it is. Astronomers, you know, have to like night work. Uh, the uh, the the this movie was uh, done. Um, nearly 20 years ago, and some of us were technical advisors for this movie. And we got some parts of it right and some parts not, but we tried to make it up. A lot of researchers. 
Uh oh, I can't control the sound. Can you guys turn the sound down? So one of the failures of this movie is the soundtrack is great. But this is a movie about a researcher who is searching for extraterrestrial intelligence and finds a signal. And uh, that signal turns out to be for a machine to come and visit the aliens. And so this is the researcher traveling to visit the aliens, traveling first from the Earth, past the Moon, past Mars, past the asteroid belt. Now the giant red spot on Jupiter, you see the Galilean moons. Right? So there's a giant storm that's going on. And the sound in the background was supposed to be the match to the speed of light, but it's off by several of the Going by Saturn. So it's very nice that for this, for this uh, fortunate uh, researcher that all the planets lined up, so that she got to visit all of them on the way. And out further is the Oort cloud, uh, and uh, made of debris, which we think the comets and some of the asteroids are from. And it's the debris from the formation of the solar system. You can see the Milky Way behind, going by some other stars. And through uh, a, a place we call a Pillars of Creation, this is an early Hubble telescope picture of a, of a large gas cloud with some dust in it, where new stars are forming. And when the stars are very bright, they have so much light pressure, they blow the cloud away from them, and they end up being in these pillar-shaped objects. So between it are where the new, star, new bright stars have formed, but you can see how many stars are there. So not only did she get to go by all the planets, she gets to go through some interesting objects, because we had nice pictures of them. And then you can see leaving the galaxy. So this is our artist concept of what we thought the galaxy was. We live in a spiral galaxy. Now we're passing through another galaxy, because the galaxies immediately line up. And there's many galaxies in the background. And another galaxy. And we travel faster and faster. So you can see the kind of galaxies. So this was the idea we had back at that time of what the galaxy distribution looked like in the sky and what it would be like to travel a huge difference distance across the universe to meet with this alien race that contacted. And you should recognize this eyeball. It's a blue eyeball. It's Jodie Foster. She, she played the lead in, 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 in the movie Contact, Carl Sagan's thing. Okay, so that was an example of what data we had. The early stuff, we had real data for the, um, for the planetary system. We had nice flybys and nice pictures. We had some pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope of stars in our galaxy and of, uh, of a few uh, other galaxies, and we sort of arranged those galaxies to kind of look the way we thought the galaxies might be distributed. And at the end of this talk, I'll show you a movie, which is uh, essentially taking all the data that we've gathered, real data we've gathered, and remaking that movie in a, in a certain sense. So you can have a feel of what what we know now, what things look like, and you'll see some differences. So in order to do that, we have to make a map of the universe, and we have to imagine a trip across the universe in order to see what things might like look like. Okay, now what is cosmology about? Well, cosmology is about explaining the universe. How is the universe formed? How is it developed? What's it made out of? How do we get to this situation? That means we want to explain everything, including... Why there's a room here? Why, why, why is the stuff here? So one of the questions is, what do we mean by that? Well, we don't mean in each individual person. We mean in a statistical sense. Why is there material here? Why do we have the various elements that we can make the chairs out of, the carpet out of, you know, the, the elements for life? Why should life exist? How can it be stable? How does it come into being? But we have to explain a lot more than that. And so we're going to use the tools that people who do crime scene investigations do forensic tools, only we're doing forensic tools to reconstruct the universe. So our idea is to do the same thing, for instance, scientists do, go to the scene of the crime, namely the universe, go and make observations, collect evidence, 
go and make computer models, you do chemistry tests to make computer models, compare the computer models to the evidence we found, and look for the you know, evidence of what happened, and look for the fingerprints of who did it and how they did it. Now, the, the issue is we don't have a catalog of fingerprints for the universe. We have to make that catalog, and we do it by making huge computer simulations, predicting what the, what the, what the universe should look like, and then comparing what we see in the actual universe, what we observe in the actual universe, comparing the fingerprints and trying to identify what we think the parameters are or what, what kind of, of things does it take to make the universe in order to see the universe that we see around us today. Okay, so the first evidence is this room, but there's plenty of other evidence. So one of the things we always go to, and I showed in the first slide, was the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, this picture. So what's interesting about this picture? Well, it's interesting that the Hubble telescope went and pointed to a part of the sky that wasn't known to be particularly interesting, <laughs> part of the sky in which no really exciting, interested object was supposed to be there. It's just supposed to be a typical sample of the sky that you go out and look at, and took a very long, deep exposure, many orbits of exposure. And so what do you see in this, in this picture? Well, you see some stars. This is a star. See the little plus? This is a star. There's one more star here. And there's one more star just off the edge here. Everything else in this picture is a galaxy. Okay. Now, that's kind of interesting in itself because I have to go away so that you can see the screen. Everything, everything else in here is a galaxy. And uh, that's kind of surprising because we have an estimate from just doing samples in the sky. There's about 400 billion stars in our galaxy. That means there's a lot of galaxies. You can also estimate there are a lot of galaxies in other ways. Namely, you just take how many, how many square degrees and what fraction of the sky is covered by the Hubble telescope, which is a very narrow field of view. It's less than 1 40th the area of the moon. You know the area of the sky. You can estimate there's roughly on the scale of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Typically, when we see a star, we see a galaxy behind it on that same sort of scale. So we're really talking big numbers. So one of the questions that we have is why in our observable universe, because the universe itself might be much bigger than what we can see, get to that, why do we need 100 billion galaxies? Clearly, if we just wanted to make life, one solar system is enough, certainly one galaxy would be enough. So if this was the regular IAS meeting, I would set up a problem for to have people calculate how many galaxies there should be. It's a very simple calculation. Anybody who's had, any engineer or scientist who's had their first year physics course should be able to estimate how many galaxies there should be. It's a very simple calculation. And, uh, so, and, the, and they should get an, an answer that's somewhat bigger than 100 billion, and that's because not every galaxy forms. It's like students. Some galaxies waste their potential and they don't become galaxies. But some other galaxies merge with other galaxies, and therefore where you had before two galaxies, now you have one galaxy, and so on. But you can still calculate approximately how many galaxies there should be with a very simple back-of-the-envelope kind of calculation. But the other thing that you see, so if you look, you see some sort of yellow colored galaxies. Here's a nice spiral galaxy we're looking at face-on. So you see the spiral arms, you see the core of the galaxy. Here's the spiral galaxy we're seeing edge on. Uh, here's a nice elliptical galaxy. Here's another elliptical galaxy. Over. So those galaxies that I, I see there that are kind of yellow color, they also are bigger than the typical galaxy in this picture. And they're bigger, you would guess, just because they're closer. But, and in fact, we have to do tests and so forth. And we can show that typically they are closer, right? And then behind them, we see some very small galaxies, some little tiny galaxies in the distance, and they're white and they're blue. So this is a surprise when this first came up. We started to get into statistics. This was an actual surprise to us, even though if we thought about it, right, Nick and I should have known. <laughs> or maybe you claim you did, you just forgot to publish it, right? Why are these galaxies that are further away, whiter and bluer than the galaxies that are nearby us, which are kind of yellow color like the sun? And... It's surprising because at that point we knew the universe was expanding. 
And galaxies that are further away, their light had traveled longer, should have been stretched more to the red, and yet they're whiter and bluer than present day. It means they were even hotter in the past. We know that means there was a lot more star forming going on, and there were a large number of really massive hot burning stars back in those days. So there's some evolution. In this picture, when you start understanding it and thinking about it, you're seeing that there's evolution. So not only do we get to explain why there's 100 billion galaxies, which I claim you can kind of do, you can also try and, and you need to explain how come star formation <laughs> is brighter at the beginning and then dies down, and you end up with stars that look like the sun rather than other stuff. And those are things that we can kind of do now. And, and you know, eventually you have to say, well, how did the first generation of stars form? How did the second generation of stars form? You know, and you need the first generation to turn in the second generation because you have to make the elements in order to have the rocky cores to make the planets like the Earth and the material like we have in the room. There's this whole sequence, and now you can kind of explain that in, in sort, of, sort of a reasonable way. So... When I say we're collecting evidence, this is an impressive piece of evidence. Now, what you'll see is we have a lot more evidence than this. But the, the, this, this is already a mouthful to explain of evidence to try and, try and deal with. Okay, so how are we going to do this? This is, a, this is a tricky problem, right? You got one chance that you're sort of on the earth. You've got maybe 40 years of doing research, if you're, if you're lucky and you can get funded and so forth. How are you going to understand... 14 billion years of the universe's history, 14 billion years in you know, light years, 14 billion years in time. It's a big thing to try and understand. But we have a tool. Our primary cosmic scene investigation tool is the fact that the universe is big. It's the same thing as our problem. It's the same thing as our ally. And so when we make maps of the universe, we put the Earth at the center just because we focus on ourselves. And we make a series of spheres around us which we'll call the spheres of time. And if we look out a distance of one light second, or in this case, the sphere is two light seconds, light takes two seconds to get to us from there. So the natural units in cosmology is light year, right? And distance, years in time, or billions of years in time. And so if we look at the moon, light takes two seconds to get here. The light that I see, when I see the moon, I'm seeing light that left the moon a second ago. When I see the sun, I'm seeing light that left the sun eight minutes ago. When I look at Jupiter, it's 40 minutes ago, typically, an hour for, for the further out planets. When I look to the nearest stars, it's four years. For a typical star, 50, 50 nearest stars, it's like 10, 10 years, but for typical stars in our galaxy, it's between 1,000 years and 100,000 years. So our galaxy alone, the light starts out on scales of thousands of years ago to get to us. But when we talk about the Andromeda galaxy, it's on the scale of 2 million years. So imagine you're at HKUST Andromeda, you know, planet 2, something like that, and you're an astronomer and you, you think that Earth is a likely place for there to be intelligent life for some reason, and you go and you convince the government to give you an incredible amount of money to build this giant telescope, and you take pictures of... The Earth, what do you see? Well, you can see the Earth, and if you look carefully, you can see China. But do you see the Great Wall? No. Why? The light that you're seeing started out two million years ago. Do you see any Chinese? No. Do you see any humans at all? No. What do you see? Well, you kind of see the shape of China. It's changed a little in two million years, but not too much. The, geolo the geology time scale is in millions of years, so you see changes. There are things that will be different. The Earth's surface of the Earth will look different than it does now, but not hugely different. You'll recognize the continents. They're not all the same and so forth. So this shows you one of the issues that, that that's the nearest large galaxy to us. You would see no evidence of any life, intelligent life on Earth. You would see evidence of life. It would be kind of blue-green and things like that. So you, when you start thinking about doing searches for intelligent life on other planets, you have to realize you're going to have to look at nearby planets just because the light travel time means you're, you're looking way far back, right? So if you really want to do it. But there's other reasons, just the signal levels. So, but that's a separate side of issue. So if I look then to a typical galaxy, you know, galaxies further out, I'm looking typically anywhere from 100 million years to 
a few billion years, that's the time scale at which the light is traveling. And if I look out as far as I possibly can out of this sphere, I'm looking back nearly 14 billion years. It takes like 14 billion years to get there. And at that point, because the universe has been expanding, the universe was a thousand times smaller than it is today. It was a thousand times hotter. It's roughly three degrees above absolute zero. That means it was roughly 3,000 degrees, which is not so different from the surface of the sun. So you get to a point where then looking at the universe was like looking at the surface of the sun. You can see the photosphere, the surface of the sun. You can see the surface of the early universe. You can't see into it because the light scattered by the, by the, by the free electrons in the, in the hot sun or in the hot early universe. And the only way we can sort of figure out what's going inside of the sun is to look at sound waves that come from, from around the sun and through the center of the sun. We can then try and image what kind of things are going on in the sun. The same kind of thing, how we try and see what happens in the very early universe from the time period from when it was a thousand times smaller back to when it was many much smaller than that. So there's a lot of things going on. So this is as far as we can see with visible light. Now some of you heard about gravity waves, and so you can see, well, you can see further with gravity waves, but there's a whole different issue involved there. So as a, a cosmologist, our idea is we want to go out and map the universe in a set of concentric spheres, get samples and concentric rings, some concentric shells around us, spherical shells around us, and each one of those shells represents a sample of the universe at a different time in the history of the universe. So that if we have a sample, we can see, if we have a map of each of those, we have a sample of what the universe looked like when it was a million years older, 10 billion years older, and so on, all the different samples. And then you can plot that against what your, your, your model is of how the universe is evolving with time from, from your basic idea. So to recap that, we live in a spiral galaxy. So that in the first movie. We don't live in the center of the spiral galaxy. We live out on the spiral arm. And so here's a sphere around us, and this sphere around us are spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, and they're very kind of modern looking. They're mostly yellow, but they have a few other bright stars. Further out, there are irregular shaped galaxies that are blue, in this case purple, or purple in a way, that are merging or are beginning to evolve into their shape. And there is a, these are farther back in time. They're further out in space, and therefore we're seeing them further back in time. These are the sort of the proto-galaxies evolving into the more modern style galaxies that we're seeing. And what's wrong with this picture is there should be roughly 100 billion galaxies inside of this sphere. So this is just represent, you know, representative picture of what's going on. There's only one galaxy inside of this sphere, but here there should be, there should be you know, a billion and there should be many billion in here. Well, you know. Billions in here and then many more billions there. And out here is this region we call the Dark Ages. That is before any stars and galaxies have formed. When we're going back from a time when the universe is extremely uniform, thousands of times hotter, are extremely uniform. These variations that I spent a lot of my career measuring are only a part of 100,000. So the universe is extremely uniform. But eventually those small variations clump up to form stars and galaxies. And it's during this epoch, which we call the Dark Ages, that that's going on. And they finally clump up enough that about here, they're starting to make the first generation of stars and galaxies. So that's, that's the plan, is to just map out these cosmic spheres of time and then compare that to what we think our, our theoretical models are, the things you should do. So how are we doing? Well, we're doing really well. This is an exploded view, Earth in the center, our own galaxy looking to be wrapped around it. Your surveys measuring galaxies at different distances that exist, and then this very precise survey using the relic radiation from the Big Bang from the time when the universe is as hot as the sun to make a map which is made with incredible precision. The variation here, the part 100,000, here the variation is essentially unity. There's either a galaxy or no galaxy. You're very nonlinear in that kind of a situation. So let me talk about what I spent a large fraction of my life on. And that is an increasingly sophisticated set of experiments to measure this radiation from the beginning. So there were some ground-based and balloon-borne measurements. And then in 1989, we launched the Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite, COBE for short. And 
we showed the next year that the radiation really is the radiation from the Big Bang. It had the right spectrum, right, and so forth. And in 1992, we announced we had discovered these variations, which you just saw a hint of here, where it's slightly cooler, slightly warmer, and varying. Then 10 years later, the microwave anisotropy probe, the, the reading WMAP after Wilkinson, who was one of our colleagues who died, uh, makes the measurement. So we went from three different wavelengths to five different wavelengths. And here you have good resolution, but when you take away the signal of our galaxy, the signal has to be smooth in order to see it, but you see, you start seeing more details. And then in 2009, we launched the Planck satellite, and it has nine different wavelength bands on it, and more sensitivity and somewhat better angular resolution. And so you make better maps, and here you see little smudges. And these smudges are just indication of the fact that the experiment also measures the polarization of the radiation. So when light scatters off a surface, like your car hood or a lake or glass, it becomes slightly polarized. So the polarization is about 5% of the temperature variation because you need anisotropic light. And so you can predict that and you can see additional information about the early universe by seeing that scattering. But it also confirms that your model is correct and that, in fact, you're understanding what you're seeing. So now I have a little movie to show you to keep you awake. So this is the Planck satellite mapping the sky. This is our third generation satellite. And it's the stealth version of the satellite. And in a way, the back of it points to the sun and the earth. The solar cells and the, and the antennas point to, to, to the back. And on the front, there is a big, a big dish antenna and a secondary antenna and a bunch of receivers. They take the signal in from the sky and scanning around many times, build up a map. This map you'll see has the plane of the galaxy in it because the plane of the solar system is 62 and a half degrees to the, to the plane of the, of the galaxy. And we're orbiting in the same plane as the Earth and the Sun to keep our back to them. And uh, so you see it build up. We open this up, rotate it around so we're in galactic coordinates. So this is the plane of our own galaxy. Since we're in the galaxy, you see some stuff sticking out. If you look optically, you see dust and stars. But if you look in the microwave, you see a thing that looks like this. Out here, we're seeing the universe fairly nakedly. And here, we're seeing the galaxy. And we're having to use the different wavelengths to subtract away or to model what, what signals the galaxy and say, this is the signal, this is the galaxy. On the other side, this is the signal that comes from the universe. So if we do that, there's a lot of people who are interested in the galaxy. But right now, my talk is about mapping the universe. So this is the map that we've released we, at first in 2013, then 2014 and 2015, we release maps. You can hardly tell the difference between the maps. This is the map of what the early universe looks like. And this map doesn't really knock you over, does it? I mean, there's a little place in here where on the, on the WMAP one, there was a little like SH initials on it, but they kind of don't stand out quite so much. But this actually tells you a lot of things. The first is... You notice how the cool spots cluster together and warm spots cluster together. What this means is there's variations on multiple scales. There's a long wavelength variation that goes cool here, warm there, and when the small wavelength varies, the smaller objects go around, they all stand out because the ones that are up on an up, they stand out as high, and the ones that are low on a low, they stand out as low, especially if you take the color scale that I picked because it emphasizes the deviations more. It's, it's brighter it's brighter color at the ends than it is in the middle. And so you see warm spots together, cold spots together, cold spots together, warm spots together. So this is telling you. The other thing, if you were very good with your eyes, you would tell there's a particular angular scale that's picked out here. And that angular scale has to do with very simple physics in the early universe, basically how sound waves from the beginning of time, how far they can spread in the time between the beginning of the universe at the time this radiation is released to come to us. We call those baryon acoustic oscillations. That was what I was going to have in the talk that I originally proposed to give. But I'm going to skip on and stay on the on technical. So this is just to say, here's our cell satellite you know, with everything on the back to face the Earth and the sun and the moon, and then various radiators to get our, our equipment cooled down by radiating away to cold space, different levels. We get down below... 60 degrees above absolute zero, and then we have 
cryogens and refrigerators to get us down to first to three Kelvin and then to three tenths of a Kelvin in order to have our detectors be very cold and so forth. Okay, so what have we been doing for 20 years? Well, it's been four years, more than that for me. So first we did the COBE satellite. Here's the same spot looked at in four different satellites, three different ways. The COBE satellite sees these variations on a very coarse scale in this particular spot, but sees the variations and told us that we should go ahead and make the measurements. WMAP sees them at a better scale, and then Planck is seeing them more, even more precisely with more sensitivity. But you can see there's a characteristic size. There's some small structures and some bigger structures, but there's one structure size that sort of dominates, and that allows us to understand a lot about the geometry of the universe and what, what the, the, the fluids are that make up the universe. Just the same way when you ring a bell, there's standing waves in the bell that pick out certain frequencies or standing waves in the, in the universe that pick out certain frequencies. And so this is continued today, right? And there will probably be one more satellite. There's a lot of discussion about who's going to do it. So COBE had about a seven degree resolution. WMAP had about a third of a degree resolution. Planck had about a tenth of a degree resolution. That's where we are as of last year. And at the same time now, there's a, a telescope in the, in the Andes in the Atacama Desert, called the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, and at the South Pole, the South Pole Telescope, this make a measurement at 0.02 degrees. And so you see the increasing resolution. You can see the maps have not really changed that, that, that dramatically, except you're seeing more and more detail. And here, you start seeing extra detail. These little spots, they're clusters of galaxies. You're getting fine enough angular resolution, you should begin to see clusters of galaxies. They have hot gas in them. They scatter the radiation from the Big Bang, sometimes higher because they're hotter than average, but they also add their own emissions, so you end up seeing least positive spots in there. But you see the, the signal structure, the overall big, big signal structure doesn't change so much, but the small scale comes up a, a, a bit more. So we take the, and this, so there is some observations here, and these, these observations continue to go on and continue to improve. And there probably will be one more satellite coming to try and make measurements in here, although focused on polarization. Okay, so from this, we have made up a model where we start out with a very simple idea of how the universe goes and a simple set of physics and a simple set of constituents. And then we run our theoretical models and we predict how the universe should develop over time. So here's the schematic of our model. So at the present day, there's a sphere around us with 100 billion galaxies in it. Now, to represent this on here, it's only a slice. That's a cut through. So instead of the whole sphere, you just have the semicircle, you know, through the center. Oh, man, it's not a semicircle, a circle through the center. And these are the modern-day galaxies. And as you trace back this volume with 100 you know, billion galaxies in it, you're surprisingly fine, which we found in 1998, that the universe is not only expanding, but it's expanding at a faster and faster rate. We call that the epoch of, of, of accelerated expansion, and we propose that there's this thing called dark energy that, that causes that to happen, and we're trying to study what dark energy and what its nature is. But roughly about 5 billion years ago is when the universe made a transition from being slowing down, where gravity was pulling everything slower, to where it started to speed up, and this new constituent was becoming to dominate it. Roughly about that same time period, four, four and a half billion years ago, is when our solar system formed. Right? That, the, our Earth is 4.55 billion years old. So we know that from dating, you know, geological dating of radioactive elements. And so so it's, uh, it tells you sort of how old this is. Our galaxy is much older. There was probably generations of stars before that. We just happen to be a somewhat later generation of stars, partly second, third generation of stars. That happen in here, but as you go back, the galaxies are younger until you get back to about the time when the universe is 400 million years old. That's when we think the first generations of star has come on. And so we've been having a controversy in the field for a while uh, about when did the universe, you know, first get to the stage of being transparent, and then when did it reionize and so forth. And so one of the things that that we that's kind of coming down is that. The early measurements in CMB were trying to, were, were, were fitting better to a universe that had a first generation of stars that was much earlier. Now we the, the latest results we're getting ready to publish soon 
is, is giving a, what we call a tau of 0.05, which is very consistent with the first generation of stars being around 400 million years. That paper should be coming out fairly soon. So 400 million years seems like a really old time, but remember the universe is 14 billion years old. So when we go back and talk about this afterglow light pattern we measured, it's 400,000 years. In terms of a human life scale, this is like 12 hours after conception. So we're, this is, you know, baby, and this is tiny early embryo in terms of what's going on. You keep tracing it back. There's this period of deceleration, and the deceleration goes on, and then there's a period of acceleration, which is called inflation. But there comes a time when we think, well, this whole volume, which has 100 billion galaxies in it now, was in a region that was significantly smaller than it than an atom. And quantum mechanics plays a very important role. And so in this model, the quantum mechanical fluctuations that come from the acceleration or from shocking the system, shocking the universe into existence, you excite every possible mode with equal amplitude. Therefore, you can easily predict how many galaxies you should get. In terms of a quantum if a galaxy is just a quantum mechanical fluctuation, stretch from a size much smaller than an atom up to the size of our own galaxy, you can just, by, the, by inflation and by the subsequent thing, you, you can do the calculation. You, f you can make a prediction of how many galaxies there should be of various sizes, how many clusters of galaxies there should be at different sizes. And you can compare that to the universe you get, and it's a very straightforward kind of thing to do. So there comes a time period way back here when quantum mechanics becomes very important, but the quantum mechanics tells you that even though the universe is made almost perfectly, that it's the variation of 10 to minus 5, there had to be variations at the 10 to the minus 5 level because quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle, said you couldn't make it any better than that. So that's interesting. So then what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are the distribution of galaxies doesn't look exactly like I showed you from that section of the movie of Contact. So here's the map. This is the part that wakes up Nick. Oh, this is old oh, for him. Here's a map that shows you a million galaxies. Okay. So you take that Hubble picture, or you take a ground-based picture of, of the sky. You throw away the stars. You take everything else as a galaxy. You have its angle on the sky. You estimate its distance, and you plot it as a point. So the Earth is here in the center, and you plot it. And every little spot on here is a galaxy. And if you take, if you point your telescope and you take a picture, and then the Earth rotates, take another picture, and so on, you'll get a, the cones get swept out into a fan. And if you change to a different angle, you'll get a different fan. So there's one fan shown here in the, in the kind of green color and another one shown in the pink color. And there's a place along here where it's difficult to see the sky because our own galaxy gets in the way. And here because weather was bad and time ran out. And that's the kind of thing. So I'll show you the geometry of that. But I wanted to say one other thing. First of all, the galaxies are not distributed kind of randomly the way they were in the movie. And, you know, there's also a different here. You see there seem to be fewer galaxies out here than in here, right? We think there are just as many galaxies out here as there are in here. These galaxies, the small galaxies, are just too faint for the telescopes that were observing it. So we think that if we had a big survey with a great giant telescope, we would get its structures that look like this going in out even further. And it's just a question of how far back in time, how long did it take for those structures to form. So let me show you the first movie of that. It shows you this survey. It shows you the geometry of the survey. So you can see the survey. You get these butterfly wings, and the butterfly wings are just fans from the different surveys. And because you do two on either side, you get a fan this way, and then you turn it slightly this way. Between them, it looks like you have butterfly wings. So you can also see there are regions where there are almost no galaxies, they're big voids, and other places where there are many galaxies, including this region right here, which is part of a structure we call the Great Wall. It's not just a string of galaxies, it's a whole sheet of galaxies. So it's not that there's no galaxies in between, this is just where we've looked, right? the issue of what's going on. So I'll show you the competing survey, that was a, mostly an American oriented survey. This is a mostly British European survey. And as you fly through, you can see the individual galaxies. So not only have their positions, but there's a little postage stamp of information about each galaxy. So you can see what kind of galaxy it is, what color it is, whatever it's going on. You swing out and look back, 
you see you have the same basic geometry. You have the sort of the butterfly wings. And again, you have regions where there are voids, where there are almost no galaxies, and then regions where there are a lot of galaxies. This is part of the Great Wall showing up. It's a different selection of the sky, but it's a part of the Great Wall showing up. So that's, uh, you know, that's the beginning of mapping, right? So we're not getting exactly complete spheres, but we're getting sections and so forth. So since then, that was the first uh, Sloan 1 and 2 and 2 degree field of view. It's become a 6 degree field of view, and then there is the Sloan 3, which was Sloan 1 and 2 were the first one I showed you. Now Sloan 3, but also called BOSS for Barren Acoustic Oscillation Sky Survey. And the survey has been showing you is the, is the yellow and the, and the red below here. Here's the survey from BOSS. And so you see there's plenty of galaxies in here. There seem to be not very many in here. There seem to be a whole band of galaxies here, a sort of part of a sphere. And then out here, a big, thick section of a sphere, right? Okay, so why is that? The galaxies are not distributed that way. This is because the survey chose to look at things at those particular places. These are the nearby ones. They're easy to measure. You get as many as there are. Here, it's near the transition point between where you go from a decelerating universe to accelerating universe, and here's a special feature you get from the early universe when the universe is getting reionized. And so I'll explain it just a little bit more. And here's a map that, that's color-coded to give you that. So the nearby stuff, you're getting almost everybody. There's just not that many. Here you did a pre-survey, and you tried to pick out galaxies that you thought were back at the distance away from you that corresponded to the, roughly to the time when the universe goes from accelerating to decelerating because you want to see wind, dark energy, whatever is causing acceleration, you want to see when it kicks in and use that to normalize what goes on from later on to understand the physics. Here it's very different. You see there's a little blue dot out here on each one of these red lines at the end of it. That's a quasar. That is, it's what we think it is is a galaxy that's very active and it has a nucleus with a black hole in it and the black hole is being very disruptive and putting out extremely bright light and it's called a quasar for a quasi-stellar object. It looks like a star because it's so pinpoint compared to so forth, but it pre presents a very s strong signal. And in front of it, you see absorption lines from the gas clouds that are starting to collapse to form galaxies in the future. So for every one of these blue dots, you get a red line in front of it. So that's why you've got that wedge that looks the same way. And then you notice it cuts off sharply. It cuts off sharply for two reasons, one of which is filters you have on your equipment in the air. The other is that the universe gets ionized about when it was roughly seven times smaller than it is today. It becomes suddenly, no longer do you have neutral hydrogen out there, it becomes ionized because the generations of stars have done it. So let me explain this a little more. Here are a spectra from two quasars. Here's a quasar that was famous when I was young. 3C273. It's from a redshift of 0.158. That means the universe was 1.158 times smaller when this quasar started emitting its light. Here's its spectrum. It emits a Lyman alpha line, a very strong line. And here you see that line being absorbed by intermediate material. So there's a few gas clouds or galaxies in between that are absorbing it. Now here is a quasar at a redshift of 3.6. That means the universe is 4.6 times smaller. Look at all the absorption lines. So there's many, many gas clouds between us, and we call this the Lyman Alpha Forest because it's not just like a single tree. It's like a whole bunch of trees. It's like a forest. And so you're, you're seeing that. So by measuring the spectrum, I'm getting to get information on all these intermediate things, and I can try and study how, how the, 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 the material is going to collapse and the form uh, galaxies is distributed. So sch schematically... Uh, you have your early galaxy with a black hole in the center that has being fed a lot, so it's tr tr transmitting a lot of light. That light starts out blue as the universe is expanding. It gets shifted to the red. When it goes through the first cloud, the hydrogen atom absorbs at its given frequency, and then that is relatively blue light, and then that gets red shifted as it travels on to the observer. Likewise, to this one, it's almost to the green. Again, it gets red shifted as it goes towards the observer. Here it's green, between green and yellow. 
it's absorbed and then it gets red shifted. So on, and here it's in the red, but it's being the light the main light is in the red, but it's being red shifted to the blue. So when you do the spectrum, you get this kind of a curve. That's why you get this kind of a shape down here. So that's how you're able to understand it and so on. Okay, so that survey uh, was finished just about a year ago in terms of taking data, but a couple of some three of our colleagues rushed with only three million galaxies out of five million to make a movie. So I want to show you a movie of the fly through from this little digital sky survey. And you'll see the survey is a little different. First of all, you get to see what a cluster of galaxies really looks like. Pretty cool. Right. Behind it, you see the distribution of galaxies. Right. Sometimes you see small groups of galaxies, voids, bigger groups of galaxies and voids and so forth. And as you sweep around through it and look through the survey, you will see that big clusters of galaxies tend to be near other big clusters of galaxies. They're not spread down at random. They're in clusters, and even the clusters are clustered. So you have, you have hierarchy on many scales. Some of you went to the talk yesterday. <laughs> Said that was predicted. <laughs> you see a cluster, cluster, cluster. It's still pretty impressive. Every one of those is a galaxy. Right? Even 3 million galaxies looks pretty impressive, right? All right. Well, you guys are... I was going, wow. <laughs> I was very impressed when I saw this movie. Okay, so not standing still, we were moving forward with a thing that we called Big Boss, right? because we were very imaginative. If you had Boss, the next thing is Big Boss. You have to stay under Moore's Law. If you're going to get to 100 billion galaxies... You got to go of another factor of 10 in galaxies every five years or you never get there, right? And so the goal here was with BOSS to get to go from 5 million galaxies to the order of, say, 20 to 50 million galaxies. I was pushing for 50. We probably do 40 million, but it depends on what's going on. And this is to measuring the universe from a redshift of, of, of 2, when the universe is 1.2 times smaller, out to a redshift of, of, of 2, when the universe is 3 times smaller. And so, it's a, unfortunately, this didn't go so much better, but didn't, this didn't project very well. But here, you're, what you're trying to do is do the same sort of thing that Boss did, where you're concentrating to get these, the sphere around us, the, center, the nearby sphere, the sphere around us, and this other sphere around us. This time, measure every quasar there is, right? if you have the capability of doing this, which is the capability of measuring 5, 000, spectroscopy of 5,000 objects at any, at any one time, then you can eventually measure all the quasars that are observable and so forth. So that's the, the goal for this thing. And surprisingly, this has stayed on schedule. Uh, extra, the Department of Energy gave the, the, the DAISY experiment, the DAISY is the instrument, extra money this year, last year and this year. And uh, surveys are being done at telescopes to, to get images to map which galaxies should be chosen, which should not be chosen. And by, for the end of 2017, uh, it's scheduled to start beginning observations. And so that will hopefully get us the next factor of 10 in galaxies, and uh, we'll see. All right, so let me continue on. Okay, so let's go back to the, the theoretical models. Here's the simulation where you just put in the fluctuation from the CMB, and you let gravity take its course over the 14 billion years. And so up here is the thing that's telling you what the redshift is. We'll go back to an early redshift when the universe is young, and the universe will look very uniform as opposed to spotty like this. It'll take a second to get back to start. And then you'll see peaks forming. The peaks form, the peaks leak up in the kind of a network. So this simulation is a simulation of dark matter particles only. That is, particles that are massive, don't interact with the light or anything else except just interact gravitationally. And then you see what forms, just taking the perturbations you see with the cosmic microwave background. So you see spots form, then the spots link up into a kind of a framework. And it looks like a dirty spider web, right? This is going to form the structure upon which the ordinary matter, the stuff that we see in this room, is then allowed the gravitation collapse on once we get to the redshift of a thousand when it can be formed neutral atoms and it's freed from scattering with the light to being able to collapse and form stars and so forth. 
So the next, the next simulation will show you the distribution of matter over scale. We're going to start on a very big scale. Here where things look sort of on the average pretty uniform, like the carpet looks pretty uniform. And then we're going to zoom in and you're going to see there's a framework. It's a structure where you see this framework that's sharpened up quite a lot and voids between, but where these filaments come together, you get clusters of galaxies. And when many filaments come together, you get a giant cluster of galaxies. So this is a 10 billion uh, millennium simulation, 10 billion particles. This is 3 billion light years across, so a good fraction of the size of the universe. And you see the framework and you see the filaments, you see the voids. Right? And the white is the dark matter and the yellow is the ordinary matter. The yellow because it, they collapse and form stars and galaxies. And we're going to zoom in on one where many filaments come together because this is a place that could be on the same sort of scale as the, as the Great Wall, right? 100,000 to a million kind of galaxy scale. So we don't live there. It's sort of surprising. We live in a really tiny village of galaxies. If we lived here, no matter where we looked in the sky, we'd see galaxies. As we zoom in, we're going to find a couple of spots like this. That's about how far we are from Andromeda. If you lived in here, no matter where you looked, you'd see a galaxy around you. It'd be harder to do the cosmic background experiment. So the, the simulation here, or the video of the simulation, zooms in on this particular place because it's one of the statistically significant ones. So we go back out. It looks pretty uniform on the average. In detail, it's very complicated structure. Right? And that's one of the features that we see is that when gravity takes place, it sharpens up irregularities and things. What When we, the universe was made, it was made very uniform. Here's sort of the fly-through. The only reason I show you this is to show you it's more complicated to be in the middle of something than looking at it from the other side. But also, you see how the white clouds are puffier than the yellow. That is, the dark matter has more trouble dissipating energy. The ordinary matter can send signals out as light, radiate away and cool, and collapse to the cores. Just like you know, when you take, get in the bathtub and wash yourself, the dirt goes to the bottom. But the dirt goes to the bottom only because it can and get rid of its bubbles and fall to the bottom. Here, it can get rid of kinetic energy and fall to the bottom of the potential wells. So we have these calculations, which allow us to take a small section of the sky where we see the fluctuations, and then run these simulations of the gravitational collapse and see this complicated elementary structure appear and compare that to what's going on. And you can take slices at various times and try and compare that to see what's going on and see if we can make a prediction of what things look like from 400,000 years right down to the present and see how accurately we can describe what we actually observe. And you can do very big simulations. So here's a history of a wedge of the universe looking from where we are now back towards the beginning of time. The beginning of time is on the outside. The universe is very hot and very uniform. As the universe cools down, it becomes less regular. Little spots begin to form. Those spots begin to link up. The structure gets to be very sharp by the time we get here at the end. Gravity takes what was otherwise a very smooth universe and makes very sharply defined edges. It's just a slightly clearer picture where you can see, see how smooth it is here, warmer and smooth, and then how it gets sharper and sharper as you get in to the present day. So this is the reason this is relevant. We're in this period of great discovery. So with the COBE DMR, if you subtract away a model of the galaxy and smooth the, the map, you get a map that looks like this. Some warm spots, some cool spots, and so forth that vary around. If you take a map of the Earth and smooth it to the same level, you get barely the continents. Right? There's no continent missing, but there's not much extra feature involved in that. Now if you go to the W map and the Planck resolution, compare the map of the Earth to the map of the universe. Well. Immediately, you realize you will not confuse these. Clearly, this is much more interesting from a textural point of view. And why is that? That's because they are like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, just long, sharp features. The edges of the continents, edges here, these, these ridges in there. There's these long, sharp features. You cannot get a long, sharp feature in nature 
unless you have nonlinearities. You have to be able to keep the phase of the short wavelength variations and the long wave variations all linked up. And the only way you do that is by having nonlinearities coupling them together. When you look in the universe, the forces that made space and time, when you created space and time at the beginning of the universe, those forces had to be extremely linear. These variations are a part in 10 to the fifth. The nonlinearity is at least order of magnitude less than that. So the force that's actually driving the formation of space and the formation of time is actually extremely linear. So for those of us that do potentials, that means it's a harmonic potential. Right? It's, a, it's a very straightforward kind of thing. And if I was given a more technical talk, one of the problems we have is we think inflation is what did this. One of the problems we have is that inflation with the harmonic potential is barely agreeable with the data. We want actually a flatter potential than that. But, but here, the evidence is pointing very strongly to the fact that the force that makes space and time is very linear, whereas the forces that make the surface of the Earth are very nonlinear. You don't get these geographical features otherwise. Okay, so now I'm getting back to showing you pictures instead of talking about science. So we're not the only ones who have been making maps. So here's a map made by our friends that do uh, astrometry, that is measure where stars are. So here's a map of somewhere between the nearest half billion to billion stars. So that's a pretty big job, the map where a billion stars are, except there's 400 billion in our galaxy. So eventually you will see this is only a teeny fraction of the job, right? You've only measured one in 400 of the stars and only nearby one. So you've got to become a French Impressionist to make a map of our galaxy. And you do that by making very coarse maps using hydrogen, you know, measuring where the hydrogen clouds are, or just measuring the total brightness, estimating what the, what the structure of the galaxy is. So we think we live in a spiral galaxy. Near us is Andromeda and, and Fornax. And they're going to merge, and then they'll eventually merge with us. Sorry about the quality of this. I, I'll show you a version of this. But our spiral galaxy is very flat. I mean, it's like a CD. It's very, the aspect is extremely collapsed flat in terms of what's going on. And you've got to go a very long way from our local group of galaxies until you start seeing another galaxy around us. There's a little one coming in. Now you're starting to see more, and then you'll start seeing a lot because we're going down that spiral arm. This is what Jodie Foster did in her trip. In contact, she went down along a path like this faster and faster, right? And then we can only see galaxy, all the galaxies at a certain distance, and then we can only see the really bright galaxy. And they are quasars and luminous red galaxies. That's why they're shown in pink. They have that same sort of butterfly kind of shape. And we can go a little further, and I'll show you these better in, in, the, in the movie here at the end. Again, you see the large red luminous galaxies and the quasars. You get further out. And surrounding it is the sphere from the cosmic microwave background. And that's as far as we have any hopes of seeing these days. We, uh, that's what we measured up until we have the 5 million galaxies that I showed you the little movie from. We haven't redone this movie yet. So we have this fantastic model of the universe. And so far, we're able to explain things to about the 1% level. And we're trying to make the measurements better and better, and we see how it goes. So let me show you the final movie that I promised. Hopefully with better sound. Get rid of Jody. So this is a movie that it's time to remake, but costs a lot of money to make it good. So this is going from the... I don't have control. He has control. <laughs> going from the highest place on the Earth, Mount Everest, from the highest to the lowest place on the Earth,
these satellite pictures. These are all man-made satellites. This is the Clark Belt or the Geosynchronous Belt. Essentially, every place that can be populated in that belt for communications is not have a satellite in it. And these are the Russian satellite orbits from launches inside of Russia because Russia is so far north. They have very limited. from Tibet. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, so I'm not really in this domain, so maybe uh, some application may not make sense to you, but um, the map you actually draw is, uh, maybe it, it depends on where we are standing in the universe, a uh, look different, right? So, so, um, so my question, question really is that to me, uh, we know that what is the sort of center of the universe, what is the corner of the universe. So it depends on where we are standing, either in the center or corner, right? So I didn't I didn't emphasize this in my talk. We make our map with the Earth at the center of the map because it's convenient because of the way we make observations, which is waiting for light to come to us, and because as a function of distance away, we're looking back that same um, that distance divided by the speed of light and time. So there's a reason we pick out that kind of thing. Now, one of the things that I mentioned but I didn't say is when you look at that simulation. When you look on the large scale, it kind of looks uniform. Any detail, any point you drop down, locally it looks very irregular and, and so forth. But if I look on a big scale, we think things look pretty uniform. So imagine that you have this great pool of water, right? And you go into this pool of water, the more details you go into, eventually you find there's this sort of group of water molecules and they're jogging around and, and they affect you and they look different. But if I average over a lot of molecules, a big area, it looks pretty much the same. And so what we, we believe, and we have reason to have it supported, is that the universe is extremely homogeneous on the large scale. I didn't argue about why that is or what it is, but you can, from using the cosmic microwave background itself, the fact that you see the universe be the same in all directions to a part in 100,000. That is, the first order of the universe is the same no matter where you look. It's isotropic. So unless you live at a very special place, isotropy implies homogeneity, right? Because if it's isotropic for you and isotropic for somebody else, it's the same everywhere. So then you have to say, all right, we live in a special place. But in fact, if you saw what I was arguing, we don't live in a very special place. We live in a little tiny group of galaxies that's not even a village of galaxies, right? You could live in one of these giant clusters that has hundreds of galaxies or thousands of galaxies or 10,000 or 100,000 galaxies, right? And the odds would be, what's the statistical odds? Where do you think your galaxy should be? Out by itself or in with a bunch of galaxies, right? So statistically, we're, we're not in a likely location. We just happen to be in a, just that's where we happen to be. And so you're now sort of arguing probabilities about where the statistic is. Now, there are other ways you can kind of test the homogeneity and the isotropy of the universe. One of the things you do is use these clusters of galaxies, and I mentioned they scatter the radiation from the beginning of the universe. And you can look to see if they're if they're the signal you get from them looks to be the same, right? Because they're giving you light that was coming to you this way, now they're sending you some light from that way, get scattered to you. So you can do some more tests. They're not as strong as the just assuming you're not in a special place and using the fact. The universe is the same in all directions to a part in 100,000. So now the question is, how, how special is where you live? And so one of the things I didn't do, which I was doing in my technical, is show you how we know that the universe's geometry is extremely close to flat. And suppose the universe isn't flat everywhere. It's, you know, it's like it's flat, and then the, it, it drops off, and there are dragons, right? Old maps and so forth. So you, you can say, well, how well, how far does, how special does the place we have to live look like? How, how, what does it take for the universe's geometry to look flat and for the universe's expansion to look uniform in all directions? And you can make arguments about what it is, but they're all arguments. I mean, what you can only do is what you can see. You can only see what we think is a very tiny fraction of the whole universe. We can only see as far as light has traveled in the 14 billion years. Right? Light that started from someplace that's 20 billion light years away has not got here. And because the universe is accelerating, it will never get here. Because in fact, things that we can now see will start disappearing outside the horizon because the universe is getting bigger faster than light's traveling. So we're going to actually see less things than more th instead of more things. For a long time when the universe is slowing down, more and more things were coming into view. Now more and more things are disappearing from view. And so there are other tricks, there are other things you can do to test that, but in fact, we just have to make 
an assumption about what's going on. Now, the assumption looks pretty good because we can make models up assuming there was this thing called inflation and assuming that it went on a reasonable amount of time. But it's not to say that lurking just beyond where we could see, there are dragons. It could be. It's not very likely. You'd have to have, it's just like the Earth. I'd argue you have to have all the phases to line up. To, for you to live in, a, at a, in the bottom of a flat well and huge mountains or huge cliffs on either, everything had to line up with phases just right. That I means you had to have a nonlinearity force that, that way. And there are people who tr didn't like the idea that the universe is accelerating and that there was be this arc energy, and they tried to say we live in the center of an underdense bubble, and therefore that's why we're doing it. But when you actually do these, look at these arguments, they're very difficult to make yourself close enough to the center to make things as uniform as they look. It's not impossible because you can always tweak things. Right? So the answer is yes to what you're saying. It's quite possible that there are special places in the universe that we live in a relatively special place. We kind of suspect the place we live in is a is a small part of a much bigger place, but other parts of the universe far from that might be very different. But we don't know for sure. It's, we're going to have to do tests and see what's going on, you know. Or, you know, before, you know, years before we discovered the accelerating universe, I I wanted to bring a grad student on who would watch for billions of years to <laughs> to see because you get to see more and more of the universe to make sure it's okay. And once you do that, you can prove it's isotropic. Once you can, if you can watch the the isotropy for over a much longer epochs, you can start showing that it's isotropic. But, you know, the idea of there being a center, or the idea of there things being special, well, we're trying to think that that's probably not what's going on. We used to have this view. We've gotten broader over time. So we used to be that the Earth was the center of the universe, and then it was the solar system, and then it turns out the solar system you know, the Copernicus principle, the, the solar system, is not the center of our galaxy. Our galaxy is not the center of our local set of galaxies. You know, the, this is what you mean by local, but but the sort of big guys around our neighborhood, once it push, pushes around, we're, we're just not in any, you know, special position at all as far as we can see. It's hard to think that somehow out of this whole universe, we're, it's all set up right around us. Right? It doesn't mean that if I go really far away, the universe is very, you know, could be very different. But right now, it's an easy working assumption that what we see plus a fairly bigger area around us is probably not very different from what we see. Uh, I have a question about the back body radiations. Um, and I know this day why we are interested in the uh, cosmic microwave background is because it tells us something about the beginning of the. Uh, the universe, okay. But I, I just wonder, how can they exclude the other possibility and how do they subtract the, the, the other uh, source? For example, we know that the solar system has a lot of things, the billions of these asteroids, billions of comets, and many gas and so on. So this is a, like a cavity. And when you have a cavity, there are many molecules, many components, so they ought to have a, a, a form of thermal radiations between them and form a thermal equilibrium. So, so that itself, you know, if, if that's almost a three degree Kelvin, so do, you already have a back body radiation within that local cavity of the solar system. So how can you exclude that and then find a signal and interpret that for the, for the beginning of the universe? Right, so it's an interesting question, but it's actually easy to show that it's okay. And uh, first of all, the temperature of the solar system is much warmer than 3 Kelvin. The average temperature is, is the sun dominates the inner part, and it's 6,000 Kelvin typically in terms of what it's radiating away. But for the average of our, in our plane of our galaxy, 20 to 40 Kelvin is the kind of mean temperature you have. You can see that. But you can measure the temperature of the dust with the radio telescopes. So how do, we, how do I know or how am I confident especially since I spent so much of my life making these measurements. Whoops, I shouldn't lean on this because it's not tied down. That, you know, how, how am I confident that this is really the radiation coming from the Big Bang, which was the, which is half of what the Kobe got credited for, right, in terms of the citation. And the answer is fairly straightforward. You can go out with your radio telescope or your other telescopes, and you can look out across the universe, and you can see signals from galaxies that are far away. So 
if you can see a galaxy at a redshift of six, I mean, I showed you the, how the Lyman alpha force cut off at six before that, you can see things at redshift of seven to nine. You can, there, there are things you can observe. And what you observed is that the attenuation of that signal is extremely small. In order to have a black body cavity, you have to have, essentially it has to be a black body. It has to absorb all the photons. Right? And so now we can argue, well, it could be a gray body because it absorbs half, right? So the emissivity is half or something. And so then you're into the question of how gray is it and so forth. So there is dust in the solar system, and it has an emissivity that's around 10 to the minus 7, so 1 10 millionth of emissivity. So even though the average temperature of the dust that's lying in the plane and, and the ecliptic dust in the plane is on the scale of 20 to 40 Kelvin, its emissivity is then multiplied by 10 to the minus 7, so it becomes essentially a millionth of a degree. Now, that becomes an issue. In Planck, we actually are starting to do correction for the dust, for the emission signal from the dust in the plane of the solar system, just barely. It's just a millionth of a Kelvin. We're making the measurements now to a millionth of a Kelvin. So for anisotropy, that matters because it's distributed in kind of a wedge in the plane of the solar system. And, and so but that, that's telling you that when you look away from the plane of the solar system, it's not very significant. It's less than a thousand. And here we're seeing a signal that's almost three Kelvin we're, we're looking at. Now, we're lucky because it's in a valley between the emissions of the galaxy. There's gal there is emission from the dust, but the dust is not very good at emitting at millimeter wavelengths because the dust particles are micron sizes. They're like 2.5 micron. You know, there's dust all through the galaxy emitted by winds from stars, you know, carrying material out and making little tiny dust, and they're micronish size. And so they're not very efficient radiators at, at millimeter wavelength. Likewise, the radiation you get from the electrons, either colliding with, with nuclei, uh, you know, with ions, or bending in magnetic fields, drops off rapidly with frequency. And... and, and uh, or shortening wavelength. So there's a valley between those two, and that's exactly where the cosmic microwave background peaks right now. So you get about a million to one window there. So we're extremely fortunate to live at the right epoch. Right? We happen to be living at a time where the temperature of the cosmic microwave background and the emission from the galaxy fall in a nice window. Now that time period is quite long. It's billions of years. And, and so, but we're, we're fortunate that... that that we're in a situation where that signal is that way because we're actually trying to measure, to map it, right? So measuring the spectrum is relatively easy, but we're trying to map its variation, and we're already down to a part in a million, and in order to do some of the polarization, we're trying to get down to a part in a billion for that. And so we had last year a very exciting report from the BICEP2 team. They had seen the polarization signal that looked like it would be produced by gravity waves from inflation, and it turns out that that though they were in a very low dust region for our galaxy, the dust was organized by magnetic fields, and that might explain the whole signal they saw. More data, more observations have to be made before, and better resolutions when we see that. But we're really trying to press down to the 10 to the minus 9 level in terms of, of sensitivity, but the polarization is only a few percent of the emissivity. So if you're at a part in a million to a part in you know, 10 million, then getting down that one more order or two magnitude is conceivable. So the answer is to your question is, in principle, yes, there is there are confusing signals. That's why we have nine wavelengths. So we can separate out the signals from the, the kinds of signals from the galaxy and for other things. We don't have to worry so much about our own solar system until now. We just barely got good enough with Planck that we actually have to make a small correction for the for the zodiacal dust in our solar system. And it's not a very important, if you leave it in and take it out, it doesn't really change the answers very much. And uh, so uh, the answer is that way. But I, I used to, especially at the time we got the Nobel Prize, I was getting an email to a week from people claiming that it's plasma around the solar system or coronasphere. Or the, you know, there's a high part of the atmosphere that has corona and something in it. Uh, getting claims that all it says. And then people just didn't put the numbers in to see how it is. And... And we're just, we're lucky. I mean, we're fortunate that we're 
we live in the wind, the cosmic background is in the window where we can see it. Right? Okay, I think it's getting late. Uh, maybe we can end it now. If you have a question, you can come to, uh, after the talk, uh, talk to us, George, privately. So, okay, let's take. Or we can go out and have. Or there's snack now, or is the snack no, was before? before? Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I should have had more snack. <laughs>